So um, thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks to everyone to be here. My name is Luca Antonelli. I'm from the University of York. And I will talk about X-ray phase contrast imaging on shockwaves on kilojoule laser scale. Before to start my, my talk, I will introduce a little bit myself. I got my PhD in 2015 at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, where I defended an experimental thesis uh, on uh, generation of shockwaves uh, in an intensity regime relevant to shock ignition. And then I moved to a first postdoctoral research associate position in the University of Rome, La Sapienza, with Professor Stefano Azzeni, where I could uh, focus uh, uh, on the study of uh, uh, modeling of plasma for ICF and shock ignition uh, targets. After that, uh, in 2017, I moved to the United Kingdom to start a new appointment at the University of York with uh, Professor Nigel Woolsey, where I had the opportunity to participate to several experiments on shock ignition that we drive at the laser Omega in the United States. And from 2019, I became research associate in energy density and material physics at the University of York under the supervision of Dr. Andrew Gibofam. And now I'm much more focused uh, on uh, uh, dynamic compression of materials. However, since my, uh, my time at the University of Rome La Sapienza, I started to develop my own interest in X-ray imaging, and in particular in X-ray phase contrast imaging. And I started to propose some experiments and build up a collaborations uh, to study this interesting diagnostic, especially applied to high energy density physics and shock waves. Thanks to the data I collected, in uh, several experiments, I could get five invited talks and three invited seminars uh, on this topic. And one of the invited talks was the last if I was an uh, invited plenary. I led five experiments as PI and, uh, and uh, I, these are the first two publications I've done on uh, XPCI, uh, but many more others uh, are in preparation because I'm still analyzing uh, some of the data. And uh, today I will uh, present uh, some of the data which are still unpublished and hopefully will be published on this, uh, on this journal. Uh, these are just a recap of my uh, number of publications and uh, uh, other bibliographic indices from Google Scholar today. So I will introduce what, what X-ray phase contrast imaging is and how to do it in a simple point projection setup. Then I will move to uh, give some details of uh, our uh, setup on the laser Omega IP. Uh, I will present the experimental results and the simulation I performed to explain what we, we have seen and finally give my conclusions. So what is X-ray phase contrast imaging? Well, X-ray phase contrast imaging is an imaging technique which combines both absorption and phase shift on a, in a single image. So if we consider this simple point projection setup, we have uh, our uh, plasma uh, X-ray source, can be a plasma or uh, something else. Uh, we have an object, in this case, I just place a spherical object here, and which is defined by, from an X-ray point of view, is defined by the refractive index, and the refractive index is given by the contribution of a real part, which is bound to the phase shift, and uh, the uh, absorption part, which is, uh, uh, which is the, the one, the imaginary part, and is bound to the absorption. And on the left, our, our detector. So the X-rays would propagate from uh, right to left. We would interact uh, with the target, we would absorb and phase shifting, and then we would go to the detector to form uh, a projection of the sphere on the detector plane. And this image may or may not contain uh, some phase enhancement, this depending completely by how, if we optimize uh, our system for, uh, for that. So in the case we didn't do that, and because maybe we were not interested to phase contrast, but only to absorption, what we could hope to measure is something like this. So this is a, a projection of a sphere, and this is an absorption image, which I simulated. Uh, and if you take a profile, uh, you can see basically absorption is uh, proportional to the density and to the uh, material thickness. So of course, in the center, the absorption is maximum, and uh, then is, is less when we go near to the border. However, if we consider, for example, a very coherent X-ray source and very energetic, so we can neglect the absorption, in that case, we could opt to measure something more like this. So this is a completely phase enhanced image without absorption. If we have a look to the, uh, to the intensity profiles along the axis, uh, we see basically that the absorption is zero. So the level of intensity of a signal in the middle of, it, of a sphere is exactly like the level of a signal of the, of the, of the source uh, uh, outside. And we have this intensity edge all around the border. 
uh, which is also locally uh, more intense than the uh, than the uh, backlighter backlighter intensity, which is a rise from the fact that this is a, a constructively interference happening uh, around the border of the object. This also suggests another thing that the phase enhancement uh, happen and it is visible wherever we have a density uh, variation of strong density gradient in our target, which is perpendicularly directed to the propagation direction of its rays. So uh, in this case, uh, because there is no density variation in terms uh, in the center of the object, there is uh, basically nothing to see in, this, in the middle. What you would obtain in the reality in this kind of experiment is more something uh, like uh, hybrid between the two. So you would have uh, some phase enhancement around and, uh, and the absorption dominating the center. Uh, so how we can, in a simple configuration like this, uh, uh, obtain some phase enhancement? So first of all, we should uh, focus our attention on the, uh, our X-ray source and uh, any X-ray source, any light source in general is characterized by a dimension, by an energy spectrum and a distance from the object. If we combine this, uh, these three uh, parameters in one formula, we can calculate what is called the lateral coherence. So the lateral coherence is a general property of every uh, light source and, uh, and define the maximum distance between two different points of a wavefront, which they can interact between each other to form an intensity edge, like the one shown in this figure. However, uh, even if we maximize the lateral coherence as much as we can, we also need uh, a, a distance R1 from the object to the detector in order to make the interference actually happen. So we need to calibrate all of these parameters uh, in order to try to have some phase enhancement in such setup. And uh, uh, to do so, we built a code, which is the one I used to do this uh, simple simulation here, which allow us to check uh, all this uh, uh, and maximize all these parameters uh, with a setup uh, uh, and with the constraints we have in the, in the experimental laser we want to go. So in our Omega P experiments, uh, our um, constraints was R0. R0 was 2.5 centimeters. Uh, to give you a, a comparison number in my first experiment on XPCI, uh, this number was 10 times higher, 25 centimeters, because it was in a smaller facility. In a larger facility, this is not possible because you can't disappoint the beam so much. So 2.5 centimeters was our working distance. Uh, however, uh, something you can do with a kilojoule laser facility is that you can, large quite, you can drive quite large target. We drive a cylindrical target, which was one millimeter in diameter and one millimeter length. with a 750 microns focal spot on the, uh, in a kilojoule laser, which was moved using a, 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 a face plate and was a very nice super Gaussian spot. And uh, we were driving uh, our backlighter target with some 100 joules uh, IR beam and uh, obtaining a very intense uh, light, X ray light source, which was completely characterized spect spect from the spectrum point of view. We, uh, it was, uh, the spectrum was picked at 8.6 kiloton volts, and that's because our target was made by copper. And we measure also the, the uh, source size, which was compatible to 15 micron in both X and Y direction. So if we look at the target from the detector point of view, the projection of the detector would look like this. So we see the cylinder and we see our, our target stock, which keep the cylinder in place. Uh, and we would irradiate uh, our, our target in this case with intensity not particularly high for 10 to 14 watt per centimeter square. And after 15 nanoseconds, we would uh, uh, acquire the X-ray image with a backlighter. So what you can see is a lot of uh, phase enhancement around, especially on the rear side, which is what we wanted. But we also noticed phase enhancement on the shock front. And uh, uh, interesting, we could see an intensity edge, which was all inside the shock wave and uh, which was uh, unexpected. So this intensity edge is uh, going all down up to the apparent in vacuum. But I don't think this is vacuum. The fact is that uh, uh, the absorption here is so low that only the phase, the phase uh, Enhancement survive, and we can still track the intensity edge, the density edge, even if uh, the absorption is uh, zero. 
So I reproduced this, uh, this data using an hydrodynamic simulation code called DUED-D developed by Professor Azzeni in, uh, in University La Sapienza. And I coupled it with uh, our XPCI post-processor to generate an image, with, an image which can be directly compared with our experimental data as I did in this image. So on the lower part, there is the simulation of the upper part of the experimental results. The, the, the shock position is perfectly matched as well as uh, the uh, intensity expected along the axis. And we also see that there is this, in, this edge inside the, the shock in both uh, uh, the simulation and experiment, but the experiment looks like a little bit uh, larger. To understand what it is, I had a look to the uh, profiles in density for uh, a different time step from one to 15 nanoseconds, taken each in one nanoseconds. So uh, we can see the progression of a shock inside. And when we switch off the laser at two nanoseconds, uh, our reflection front is formed and the reflection would travel inside the shock wave, would reach the shock front. And when it reach the shock front, the shock become a blast wave and start to decelerate and the pressure also start to decay. But as a, as a resulting uh, from our simulation, we see also that a perturbation in density is creating and is also remain there creating this discontinuity in the profile, which is also measured in our experimental data. If we look to the pressure, however, we don't see any perturbation in the pressure profile. And this suggests that this is just a perturbation and not a shock uh, and a new shock reflected or whatever. Another shot I want to show you today is the second one uh, interesting was a double shock. So we were interacting with two laser beams at higher intensity compared to before. And our target and mounting the uh, uh, gold, uh, gold green of the top to measure the resolution. So a first uh, uh, laser would interact with the face. And after 13 nanoseconds, a second shot would interact uh, uh, on the same face and would launch a second shock inside the cylinder. Uh, and after uh, 15 nanos after two nanoseconds more, so at time 15 nanoseconds, we would shot our backlighter to obtain this image. And we can see the gold grid, the target stock and the rear side of the target, uh, the first shock and the second shock front with uh, uh, a higher level of, uh, of uh, um, phase enhancement. This is not surprising because we were driving stronger shocks. So the density ratio between compressed and compressed region is higher. Uh, we see also that the second shock is a little bit asymmetric compared to the first one. And also this is expected because the laser were not normal to the target, were incident of 20 degrees. And uh, the second, sh the second uh, laser was not finding a solid target there anymore, but it was interacting with a uh, plasma of, uh, of plastic. So uh, what is interesting is that the distance between the, uh, the, second sh the first and the second shock front in the lower part of the target is larger. And in particular, the second shock is propagating a low density pl plasma. And if we measure the absorption just before and after the shock, we notice that uh, the absorption is basically the same, which suggests that the only reason why we can track all the way down the, uh, the shock front is because we have phase enhancement. And without it, we would, we would miss this, uh, this, uh, this information. Also in this case, I reproduce our data using uh, the simulation and uh, uh, without any surprise, I could reproduce uh, the, uh, the position of the shocks as well as the, as the uh, intensity profile as expected. And, uh, so I can now give my conclusion and uh, we, pro uh, we proved that XPCI uh, is feasible on a large kilojoule laser facility. We shows also that uh, the XPCI can uh, detect some uh, absorption, uh, some feature which would be missed uh, with a, a normal absorption radiography only, such as the residual interaction of a reflection shock with a shock front and the presence of a second shock in the target low density region. And uh, uh, now we are, uh, we are ready to use XPCI for uh, astrophysical experiments uh, uh, where uh, we can use low density materials, uh, where probably this technique as, uh, is uh, the best uh, approach and use as also proved by recent publications uh, on, uh, on, uh, on relative instabilities uh, uh, made by uh, Michel Koenig. So uh, thank you very much. And I would just leave you the contributor list of the people I had the pleasure to work with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, 
So I have a small question. So as uh, from the how to say the um, page of the shock, the single shock, um, as uh, how to say as the time goes on, uh, the perturbation of the rare um, rare faction will it grows? Yeah, here this page. So will yeah. it grows uh, increase or decrease? I mean the perturbation of the rare faction. Is look is decreasing. Uh, uh, another another fact is that uh, if you do a one D simulation uh, of the same system, you wouldn't see any perturbation at all. Uh, so this is suggests that this is more like uh, uh, depending of a two dimensional problem. It is if, uh, a planar shock wave propagating. Uh, I saw something similar in my first experiment, but was not so clear uh, where I had this peak intensity inside the shock, uh, but uh, uh, the data were not uh, uh, as nice as you, the data you can collect on, on Omega. And uh, at the time, uh, I was not really able to understand why I had that. But now I see that uh, I did some other simulations where if uh, you shrink the focal spot of a laser, you just keep uh, you keep the uh, all the other uh, uh, all the other things uh, unchanged like intensity, pulse duration. But you shrink the focal spot of a laser, uh, this perturbation would become higher. So it's uh, two dimensional dependent. Okay, but, but I think this point, it's very important. Maybe in future you can, how to say, um, take a bigger perturbation and say, um, let's say effect. And uh, you can, I, I, and I think this can be well explained from physics. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for suggesting. Uh, next question from Michelle Koenig. Hi, Luca, nice talk. Hi, Michelle. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm still very, very confused. <laughs> <laughs> we already discussed. Your results. <laughs> we discussed yeah, because, quite. Yeah, yeah. Especially in the song on the, the two shocks. First of all, where does it come from? Especially the second one. You mean the perturbation? No, the second one, the, the two shocks. Yes. Here. Where? Does it come from the bottom or the fall from the top? No, it's uh, so your second laser was interacting, was focused exactly like the first one. Yes, but, but where, where, yes, but is it the, the one from below on your scheme or from the top? Uh, uh, in the reality, I mean, now this, uh, this, how I represented here the beams is not how they were in the reality. Uh, so I'm sorry okay. if maybe this is confusing. Uh, so probably is uh, exactly the opposite. Okay. So probably the first uh, would be come from down, and this, uh, probably the first would be come from down. The second would be come from the top, probably. But I'm, I, um, I'm not sure. I I'm check. very sup I'm surprised that the second shock you don't have an, uh, a higher absorption than the first one because you compress again by a factor yep. of two or three. It's just plastic. Yeah, this is just uh, polystyrene plastic. We used a very well-known material because uh, we didn't want any, any uh, surprise in the equation of state. Uh, and also the intensities were calibrated to be something our codes could reproduce. So uh, you compress, uh, but, uh, but as I said, if I measured the uh, I have more details images, uh, but I, I measure the, the, basically if you look like uh, the uh, absorption here, what you see is that uh, the absorption is flat, then you have uh, this, uh, this phase, uh, phase future, and then it's flat again just after. So uh, I don't know, maybe I, I, you would expect to see an higher compression probably. But, oh yes, uh, because you, you you clearly see the compression, the higher absorption of the shunt front, and you you should you should see the other one behind. Yeah, this one here. Higher than the, the first one. Yeah, uh, but this is not the case. I don't know why, but uh, uh -huh. okay. Uh, also, if we look anyway. at the, the here the the simulation, you would just go up immediately, at least in the in when you do when you do the, the synthetic radiography. Okay, thanks. Welcome.